Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 3. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 5 of our Insanity walkthrough, and we finally bring some action back to the series. In the last episode, we took a tour through the not new but still improved Normandy, and we also completed a small side mission by clearing out a Cerberus lab on Sanctum and securing a few Reaper artifacts. Those artifacts have now actually been added to our war assets, alongside the Javelin missile launchers that we picked up from scanning the planet Watson, and which are likely a reference to a side quest from Mass Effect 2, during which we had to prevent a group of Batarians from launching these missiles. The Reaper artifacts meanwhile give us some insight into the Reapers, and might help us improve our combat strategies against them, all in all leading to a slight increase in our military strength. And indeed, the situation all across the galaxy is very likely only going to get worse, so let's do our best to keep the fight going. Our business here in Sigurd's Cradle is now actually more or less completed at this point. You can see though that we have not yet grabbed all of the available assets, so let's quickly do that with one more scan here in the Skepsis system. We are once again recovering just a bit of fuel here, enough to almost fill our tank to capacity. And with that we can now leave the Skepsis system and jump all the way to the other side of the galaxy to the Apian Crest, where the next chapter in the game's main storyline continues. Now the first thing that we want to do here is to actually immediately leave the system that we arrive in, and instead burn some fuel to head over to the Castellus system. And of course, there are some assets to recover here, so let's perform a quick scan. I found something. Right, so we have found something, but as you can see we have also alerted the Reapers to our presence, although at least for the moment they are keeping their distance. What we have found is then once again just a bit of fuel, but we are not done yet, so we have to perform another scan. If you position the Normandy just right, it is actually possible to get both of these locations with only one scan, but the scans are free and performing more of them will actually help us unlock another achievement in just a moment. For the time being though, we can move forward with another small side quest, because scanning the planet here allows us to grab a hold of the banner of the Turian 1st Regiment. Now at the moment we don't know anyone who might use this, but we are close to the Turian homeworld, so it probably can't hurt to have it. Also, scanning for a third time here now fully alerts the Reapers to our presence, and as a result they are now appearing right here in the galaxy map. However, escaping them is as easy as just leaving the system, Evasion successful. and doing so also unlocks the untouchable achievement. Now moving on, we hold off on completing our quest for just a little while longer and instead head over to the other side of the cluster, because we are far from done collecting assets. Signal confirmed. This time though, we only need to perform one scan, which also brings a lot of Reaper attention our way. Luckily though, it's not enough for them to investigate. Instead, we can now dispatch our fourth probe of the game, which allows us to recover a war asset, namely what's left of the Turian 79th flotilla. This is certainly going to be very helpful in our fight against the Reapers, which can unfortunately not be said for the other two locations here, as both of them are just fuel depot wreckages, in total offering over one and a half thousand units of fuel, much more than we have capacity for. Still, we are not coming back here anytime soon, if ever, so let's grab everything we can even though we might not need it, just for the sake of completion. Now with all of the assets in the Apian Crest recovered, we can now finally begin today's mission, which brings us very close to, but not onto, the Turian homeworld. Instead, we are landing on Palavan's largest moon, because our mission here is not actually to help drive back the attacking Reapers, but instead to only rescue the Turian Primarch, who will then hold a war summit, which currently seems like our best hope to unite the galaxy's races against the Reapers. Now the preparation for this one will actually be rather quick, squad-wise we have no other choice but to pick Liara and James, we are also taking the exact same loadout as we did in the last episode, so we'll be playing this one with just a pistol and a sniper rifle, and we have also not earned another level up since the last mission, so there are no squad points to spend and we can immediately jump into the action.
Oh no. No. Palavin. We have an old friend there. Holy hell. They're getting decimated. Strongest military in the galaxy and the Reapers are obliterating it. Was it like this on Earth? Yes. Shepard. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Commander, the LZ's getting swarmed. James, open that hatch. Okay, here we go, and right away it's sniper rifle time. Our landing zone is being swamped by husks, and clearing them out from here is not only a nice target exercise, it actually also makes the fight a bit easier once we touch down. All right, get in, get out. Let's move. This early in the mission though, the enemy numbers are nothing too crazy. We are dealing with, I think, about 10 enemies here, all of them husks, and we could probably solo the entire encounter with Shepard himself by just using concussive shot. And that's it, with that the landing site is already cleared, so let's get some directions now from our Turian friends. Soldier, which way to your commanding officer? Straight ahead and around the corner, past the first barricade. Alright, fairly straightforward, but we are taking a small detour here, that is, if we can manage to actually climb up here, but we are rewarded with a very short conversation. That Reaper is enormous. It's not bigger ones on Earth. A whole lot of them. Got it. And with that, we can now make our way into the Turian camp. Hold your fire! Friendly inbound! Right, so before we find and eventually talk to the commanding officer, there are a few things to find and conversations to overhear, so let's get started. Try them again. When I command West Airfield, do you read? Nothing, sir. Not even static. Try them again. Respectfully, sir. I've been getting nothing. That's an order. The reinforcements haven't arrived. Over here in the middle of the camp, we can grab some credits from a data pad and also unlock the M97 Viper sniper rifle, which we are going to equip very shortly, but not yet. Over here on the side, we also have another data pad showing us how dire the situation is, because even though it may not look like it at the moment, the Turians don't seem to have much going for them, which I think makes it even more important to quickly find the Turian Primarch. Tabestic, get your men up on that north barricade. Yes, sir. Sergeant Bardas, find a way to get that comm tower operational. Sir. General. Commander Shepard, heard you were coming, but I didn't believe it. General Corinthus. I've come to get Primarch Fedori. Primarch Fedorian is dead. His shuttle was shot down an hour ago as it tried to leave the moon. That's gonna complicate things. Right, first things first, it sure can't help to get a short status report, even though we probably already know the answer. How bad is it, General? We just lost about 400 men in half an hour. We set up camps on this moon as an advanced position to flank the enemy. A sound strategy, just... Irrelevant. Exactly. The sheer force of the Reapers seems to make them immune to that sort of tactic. The Primarch and his men found that out the hard way. We are also going to give the General our condolences for the Primarch's loss. I think that is the least we can do, and it shows that we care, not to mention that it also gives us two Paragon points. I'm sorry. I hear he was a good man. And a friend. He would have been an outstanding diplomat. So what happens now? The Turian hierarchy provides very clear lines of succession. Right. General Corinthus? With such heavy casualties, it's hard for me to be certain who the next Primarch is. Palavan Command will know. However, at the moment, contacting them is impossible. The comm tower is out. Husks are swarming that area. We can't get close enough to repair it. Don't worry, General. I'll get your tower operational. Thank you, Commander. I'll take care of things on this end. All right, let's go. 
I see the comm tower. To the left of the main barricade in front of Palavin. Let's go! Right, now before we leave, there are a few more things to collect here, including two upgrades for our pistol that we definitely want to grab, because at the moment we don't have any. Sir, shuttle carrying the fighter mechanics has not arrived. Resume MIA. How many fighters are prepared? 29, sir. Have the crew make only critical level 8 repairs. Every serviceable fighter is in the air. ASAP. Got it? Yes, sir. Now at this point we can also use the conveniently located weapons bench and switch over to the new M97 sniper, which we will promptly upgrade with the same attachments as the M92. Overall the weapon is also a bit lighter than the M92, therefore increasing our power recharge speed by 25%. Now our pistol also receives some upgrades, increasing magazine capacity and armor piercing capabilities. And we want to keep in mind here that Shepard is actually not the only one using a pistol. Liara has one too, so let's quickly slap those same upgrades onto hers as well. And of course, every time we use a weapons bench we also have to reactivate our ammo powers. So let's do that for both Shepard and his squad members and then head out. On the way, we can quickly grab another medkit as well as another datapad, this one telling us that the Turians stationed out here have apparently been delivered winter gear. Not really what they need at the moment, I think, but better than nothing. Another armor upgrade is then also added to our collection, and afterwards, after once again having a bit of trouble climbing, we can get our hands on two more items of interest, namely an armor-piercing mod for the assault rifle, as well as the M27 scimitar shotgun, which we are going to take, but not equipped just yet. And with that we can leave the outpost and head back into combat. Our mission here is quite simple. Clear the radio tower, which is once again currently swarming with husks. Husks at the tower overwhelmed us. Good luck. Now the attacking husks will come from two directions, and being melee enemies going to cover here is really not all that necessary. As you can see, some of them will come from the left side here, and the others from the radio tower straight ahead. As always, a few fire explosions triggered by concussive shot are the easiest way to deal with them, but just like at the landing site, there are just a handful of them, so the pathway to the radio tower is quickly cleared. can't repair it from this panel. Alright, now we have to make a choice and we are sending James to make the repairs. This will keep Liara and most importantly her crowd control singularity ability available to us, and I would consider that a bit more important for what comes next. James, you're up for tower repair. On it, might take me a while but I'll do my best. Here they come. Ready, Liara? You bet, let's take these monsters. Right, so our next task here is rather straightforward, I think. We have a ton of husks coming in and we need to hold them off until James can finish the repairs. By the way, just in case you're wondering, both James and Liara are equally well suited for the repair job. Choosing between the two is really just a question of who you want to have with you in this fight. And even though she has a much lower damage output and is far less tanky, I still usually go with Liara. Her singularity is just invaluable against these unarmored enemies and helps us quickly get rid of them without ever being in any real danger. Now at this point James is finished, so communications should be up and running, and there is nothing that stops us from heading straight back to the Turian camp. However, we are here to help, so let's do exactly that. General, do you read? The comm tower is now operational. Much appreciated, Commander. I'll contact Palavin Command. Let me know when you've got something. I'll help your men till I hear from you. Understood. Shepard up. Right, so for the next few moments here we want to clear out all the remaining husks in the area, but again this is an entirely optional task. We could also skip this fight and make a beeline straight back to the general, but I don't think that is what our shepherd would do in this situation and it is a fairly easy fight anyway. So even though we don't get any additional experience points for it, let's stick around just a little while longer. Go ahead. I have information from 
Palavan Command. Please return ASAP. On our way. And now there are in fact no more husks to shoot, which means this part of the mission is completed, for which we earn a few experience points, enough to advance us to level 35, and we'll take care of that in just a moment. What have you got? As your partner said, succession is usually simple. But right now, the hierarchy's in chaos. So many dead are MIA. I need someone. I don't care who. As long as they can get us the Turian resources we need. I'm on it, Shepard. We'll find you the Primarch. Garrus. Vicarian, sir. I didn't see you arrive. At ease, General. Good to see you again. I thought you'd be on Palavin. If we lose this moon, we lose Palavin. I'm the closest damn thing we have to an expert on Reaper forces, so I'm... advising. James, this is Garrus Vicarian. He helped me stop the Collectors. He's a hell of a soldier. Lieutenant, good to see you too, Liara. Good to see you in one piece, Garrus. General Corinthus filled me in. We know who we're after. Palavan Command tells me that the next Primarch is General Adrian Victus. Victus? His name's crossed my desk. Know him, Garrus? I was fighting alongside him this morning. Lifelong military. Gets results. Popular with his troops. Not so popular with military command. Has a reputation for playing loose with accepted strategy. And perhaps it was to be expected, but yes, Garrus is back. And he seems to know a bit more about this Adrian Victus, so let's make him share that information. What do you mean? On Tatris, during the uprisings. His squad discovered a Salarian spy ring about the same time the Turian Separatists did. Rather than neutralize the ring, he fell back. He even gave up valuable fortifications which the Rebels took. Then the Rebels attacked the Salarians, and when both groups had worn each other down, Victus moved back in didn't lose a man. Bold strategy, but wild behavior doesn't get you advanced up the meritocracy. Primarch Victus, that should be something to see. And we are sticking to the Paragon path in this conversation as well, although given the overall galactic situation, I would say that both dialogue options here are equally valid. You think he can get the job done? We both know conventional strategy won't beat the Reapers. Right now he could be our best shot, and I trust him. Okay, let's get him on the shuttle and get out of here. Commander! Shepard, come in! Can this wait, Joker? We're in the middle of a war zone. We've got a situation on the Normandy, Commander. It's like she's possessed. Shutting down systems, powering up weapons. I can't find the source. I need the Normandy standing by. We may have to bug out. Should I go back and take a look? Do it. Garrus, you said you were with Victus this morning? Yeah, but we got separated. He went to bolster a flank that was breaking. Could be anywhere out there. We're trying to raise him, Commander. Incoming Harvester! Headed for the airfield! General, tell Primarch Victus we'll rendezvous here. In the meantime, let's go take care of whatever that thing dropped off. Coming, Garrus? Are you kidding? I'm right behind you. Right, so here we go. Garrus has replaced Liara in our squad, and we have to take care of a level up anyway, so let's quickly go ahead and spend some points. With Shepard, we are unlocking the fifth rank of Combat Mastery, opting not for increased squad member weapon damage, but instead for increased headshot damage. As you know, I like using sniper rifles, and this makes them a bit more powerful. With James, meanwhile, we are saving our points, and that brings us to Garrus, and with 39 points to spend, we can go all out here. First of all, we are moving his Overload ability all the way up to rank 5, as we are in dire need of some tech powers now that Caden is in the hospital. At rank 4, we are going with Chain Overload, allowing us to hit one additional target, and then at rank 5, we are going for the Recharge Speed Upgrade. Garrus is not really that much of a power user in this game, so he doesn't get much in terms of cooldown bonuses. Up next, we are now grabbing all six ranks of armor-piercing ammo. This is basically Garrus's set-it-and-forget-it power. Most effective, of course, against armored enemies, but even against unarmored foes, the health damage bonus is still substantial, especially after picking both damage upgrades at rank 4 and 6. 
Now this leaves us with three more points that we can use to get Turian Rebel going, giving Garrus another substantial weapon damage bonus as well as some additional protection. And with that it's time to activate our ammo power, set up our hotkey, switch over to the sniper rifle and then take our Turian ally into combat, because that harvester that just flew by apparently dropped off some enemies. Jade, is that you breathing so hard? Atmosphere's a little thinner than I'm used to is all. Adrenaline's better than oxygen any day. All right, here we go, straight into the fight, and as you can see, we are facing a new type of enemy. Just me? Or do those Reapers look like Turians? You're right. They do. And yes, indeed they do. These are Marauders, the first shielded Reaper units we have encountered so far. And among a sea of husks, they definitely deserve all of our attention. And because of those shields, it is definitely convenient that we have spent some points in Garrus's overload, which we can now use to strip away most of that additional layer of protection, and followed up by just one shot of our new M97 sniper rifle that is enough to get rid of all of the shields, at which point fire explosions and concussive shot will do the rest. Now, Marauders also have two abilities that make them somewhat annoying in combat. The first one is their fondness for combat rolls, which they frequently use to dodge projectiles like those from Concussive Shot. The second one is their ability to create an armor plating for the husks in the area, making those husks a lot tougher to take down, and I believe also no longer vulnerable to being knocked down by Concussive Shot. Luckily for us, though, that armor creating process takes a few seconds and is also accompanied by a very distinctive sound, usually giving us enough time to take out the Marauder first. That is, at least as long as the Marauder comes alone or in pairs, which for the time being is thankfully still the case. I think we're done here. Okay, it seems like it's time to return, but before we do so, let's grab some credits from the crates over here, the second bit of loot available in this area after the Assault Rifle magazine upgrade that we already picked up at the beginning of the fight. Shepard, come in. Go ahead. Still trying to raise the Primarch, but we've got trouble back here at the main barricade. If the Reapers breach it, we're done. On my way. Alright, and with that, we are now about to jump into what is arguably one of the most fun sections in this mission, as we are now allowed to take control of a mounted gun turret, a weapon that just hopelessly outclasses the husks below, and therefore turns this next part into a lovely shooting gallery, even on insanity difficulty. With 50 rounds of ammunition, the turret also has plenty of firepower before we need to reload. However, it is advisable to fire in short bursts, like we are doing here. Otherwise, the fast firing rate will still burn through the magazine fairly quickly. And even though they're weak, there are plenty of enemies below, giving us not a whole lot of breathing room. Heads up! Here comes another wave! Now, as we're nearing the end here, two more quick things that might be interesting about this fight. Number one, you can absolutely leave the turret at any time and use the husks to, for example, farm melee kills. Number two, even if you decide to stay stuck behind the gun, your companions are of course not, although they can sadly not leave the barricade itself. Still, the regular use of their abilities, especially James's Carnage, might be useful, because yes, those are of course still available, even though the hotkey bar in the top left is currently not visible. Right, so we are facing a heavily armored brute now, however, taking down armor fast is exactly what we are built for, and a few quick fire explosions make this fight a lot less difficult than it may have seemed at first. Shepard, Corinth is here. What's the word on the Primarch? Still can't get a stable comm link. Okay, I'm going on foot. Shepard out. Garrus. Take me to the last place you saw Victus. Right, and with that, we are now leaving the outpost behind, as the brute actually knocked us down to the exterior side of the wall. How far? 
Should be pretty quick, unless we find trouble. Now, for Mass Effect standards, the journey is actually fairly lengthy, but it's also littered with small bits of dialogue between James Shepard and Garrus, not to mention a few items of interest as well. Damn it. Look at Palavin. That blaze of orange. The big one. That's where I was born. That's rough. Still have family there? My dad. A sister. How bad is it? Three million lost the first day. Five the second. How's your military holding up? Look around. That should give you some idea. You're putting up a good fight. For now. But how long does it take before the fight's kicked out of you? If they'd only listen to your warnings about the Reapers, we might have been ready. Maybe. Hard to figure how you prepare for something like this. Also, even though this is mostly a peaceful and quiet section of the mission, there is going to be a small bit of combat, and it happens right here as we are ambushed by husks. Got more back here. There is also a second group sneakily coming in from behind, but even on insanity difficulty that should not be too much of a threat. Shit, I hate those things. And New York is crawling with the creepy bastards? Uh, I never should have left Earth. It's gonna be bad all over. Leaving the fight just pisses me off. But you're here asking Victus to do the same thing. Leave the fight to make nice in some boardroom. This summit is the only chance we've got. None of us is beating the Reapers alone. And there we are. The sight of Malturians likely means that we are close. Soldier, you okay? Yes, sir. We'll make it. Have you seen General Victus? Half hour ago, and itself. Okay, good luck. Yes, sir. Commander, how many troops in that crash? 50? 75? Not sure. Sounds right. Hard to see a beautiful ship like that go down. Not to mention the men serving. Yeah. Yeah. We should go. They said the Primarch was headed south. Oh, look out! That was a little closer than I'd like. I'll say. Also, and I'm not specifically mentioning it every time because usually other people are talking, but of course we do want to pick up everything that we come across. Most importantly, that sniper rifle upgrade from just a few moments ago. So, Loco, you really think this summit will work? I mean, Asari? Solarians? Where's the Krogan and Batarians? Where's the meat? It's not that easy. The Batarians took the first hit when the Reapers arrived. Not much left of them. And the Krogan have never forgiven us for the Genophage. Right. Turians sterilized them. Tolarians came up with it. And the Krogan hate them both for it. So they won't be joining us. Too bad. I fought with the Krogan. They're tough sons of bitches. Alright, and that bit of chatter actually unlocked or updated a few codex entries. And we are also getting very close to things getting a bit more heated. Okay, double time. No Reapers taking this Primarch from me. Right All right, we have made it to Victus's camp, but for one last time in this mission, we are going to meet some heavy resistance. We are once again facing a few marauders, but this time accompanied by cannibals and not by husks. And those cannibals are now actually also a bit more powerful than they were in the intro mission back in episode one. Not only can they eat other fallen enemies to regain health and also a bit of armor, but they are also able to launch grenades. Move into the compound! Moving! Right behind you! Still, the Reaper's first line of defense here is quickly defeated, and so we can move closer to the general. Unfortunately though, the path is blocked by another brute, but just like in our previous encounter, this does not pose as much of a threat as one might think it would. Still, the cannibals fire and their frequent grenades are keeping us on our toes. Good thing for us that we have two excellent cover positions here to switch between. And even though we are doing a good job thinning out the enemy numbers, leaving that cover is really not advisable. Yes, we are technically level 35, but on insanity difficulty our enemies just pack too much of a punch, so I think it's best if we play it carefully. Sooner or later our enemies will come to us. Give it everything you've got. 
In just a second, we will also be grabbing another achievement here, as we have unfortunately not seen the last of the brutes. And killing such a brute as it's charging us will unlock the Eye of the Hurricane achievement, and with a few well-timed fire explosions we are more than capable of doing that. But the tide's turning. Turn up the heat. So it looks like we have a third brute coming in, but for this one we are taking a slightly different approach. What you just saw was the Reaper Black Star, a heavy weapon not unlike the M920 Kane from Mass Effect 2, but unfortunately one that we can only use once. Once the shot has been fired, we are not taking it with us, and the weapon is instead simply thrown away. Nonetheless, it helped us make some good progress here, as the area is now more or less cleared. That means we have the opportunity to grab another sniper rifle scope as well as a medkit, and those can actually somewhat easily be missed, as the end of this mission is triggered automatically by simply moving too close to the Primarch, at which point we will never be able to return. From the medkit we are also earning ourselves another level up, and before we finish the mission we can grab a second one as well. General Victus. Yes? I'm Commander Shepard of the Normandy. A uh, commander. I know who you are. I can't wait to find out what brings you out here. Vicarian, where did you go? Heavy Reaper unit on the right flank. I believe your exact words were, get that thing the hell off my men. Appreciate it. General, you're needed off planet. I've come to get you. It will take something beyond important for me to lead my men or my Turian brothers and sisters in their fight. Fedorian was killed. You're the new Primarch. You're needed immediately to chair a summit and represent your people in the fight against the Reapers. I'm Primarch of Palavan. Negotiating for the Turian hierarchy? Yes. I've spent my whole life in the military. I'm no diplomat. I hate diplomats. Well, admittedly, his doubts are somewhat understandable, but then again, he really does not have that much of a choice at this point. What makes you think you're not qualified? I'm not really a by-the-book kind of guy, and I piss people off. My family's been military since the Unification War. War is my life. It's in my bones. But that kind of passion is... deceptive. It can make you seem reckless when you're anything but. And now we can grab the final two Paragon points of the mission here. No, honestly, he might not be the perfect candidate, but considering what lies ahead, it might be best to empower him any way we can. War is your resume. At a time like this, we need leaders who've been through that hell. I like that. You're right. And honestly, uniting these races may take as much strength as facing the Reapers. See this devastation, Primarch? Double that for Earth. I need an alliance. I need the Turian fleet. Give me a moment to say goodbye to my men. Without him down here, there's a good chance we lose this move. Without him up there, there's a good chance we lose everything. Look at that. And they want my opinion on how to stop it? Failed CSEC officer, vigilante, and I'm their expert advisor? Think you can win this thing, Shepard? Yeah, I don't know, Garrus. But I'm sure as hell gonna give it my best shot. I'm damn sure nobody else can do it. For whatever it's worth, I'm with you. Welcome aboard. Are you ready, Primarch Victus? One thing. 
Commander, I appreciate your need for our fleets, but I can't spare them. Not while my world is burning. But if the pressure could be taken off Palavan... That's a pretty tall order. We need the Krogan. I can't see us winning this thing without them. Get them to help us, and then we can help you. The Krogan. Looks like your summit just got a lot more interesting. The Asari have been down this road before, Commander Shepard. But, Madam Counselor, let me... I tried to smooth things over with the Salarian Dalatras. To say she's upset would be a monumental understatement. Some of these issues are hundreds of years old. Time to let go. Sad to say, but any effort to ally these disparate groups seems doomed to failure. And I'm sure you understand that we cannot afford to waste time with the Reapers knocking at our door. This must be my final word. I'm sorry, but the Asari will not be at your summit. Our lines would be stronger with the Krogan. You need them. We all do. I wish you luck, Commander. Goodbye. Commander, Admiral Hackett's available on VidCom. So there we are, with the mission completed and the mobilizer achievement unlocked. Technically, we are now ready for the war summit, but let's first check in with Admiral Hackett and see what he has to say. Commander, have you retrieved the Primarch for your summit? Yes, sir. But the Asari are staying on the sidelines. They'll regret that. The time for unity is now. The Salarians will be there, though. You don't sound very optimistic. We expect the Krogan will be joining us, too. I see. Well, then you've got your hands full, Commander. Was there something else you needed to discuss? Alright, excellent opportunity to talk strategy here. And who better to do that with than one of the most high-ranking officials in the entire Alliance military? Have you pieced together how the Reapers hit Earth? It wasn't all that complicated, really. They searched through the relays and hit Archura's station before we knew what was happening. From there, it was a short jump to the Sol system. Earth didn't stand a chance. Sending us to the Mars Archives was a good call. Still doesn't make up for the fact that the Reapers nailed us to the wall. I sacrificed the entire second fleet to provide cover for the third and the fifth to retreat. Hell, I presided over the most devastating military defeat in human history. How do you see us winning this war, Admiral? By making you the tip of the spear. I'm flattered, but the Normandy's just one ship. And a fast one. You can move quickly, hit a target, and leave before the enemy has time to react. It's an advantage, but can it win a war? It's the larger principle that matters. We'll never defeat the Reapers in a full frontal assault, Shepard. The battle against Sovereign three years ago took everything we had, and that was just one Reaper. I haven't forgotten. So I'll find their soft spots, avoid them where they're strong, and hit them where they're not. And when I find gaps in the armor, I'll hammer them with every soldier's ship and bullet we've got. How long can we keep that up? As long as it takes. The reality is, Shepard, everything I'm doing is a delaying action for you. I'm buying us time, keeping us in the game while you gather what we need for this Prothean device. So keep at it. Has your analysis of the Prothean device turned up anything? The R appears to be right. It's a weapon of some sort. A big one. Beyond that, we really can't say, other than it's going to be a hell of a thing to try and build. Do you think it's risky? Building something like this when we don't even know what it does? To be honest, the thing scares the hell out of me. But the Reapers have forced our hand. Two centuries ago, scientists faced the same problem in the Second World War. They weren't sure what the atomic bomb might do. Some thought it could even ignite Earth's atmosphere, but they did it anyway. Any updates on Cerberus? There's still the wild card here. Hitting the Archives on Mars suggests they're after the same thing we are. A way to defeat the Reapers. It didn't seem as if the Elusive Man was suggesting we appease them. Not like Saren did. You'd think we'd be on the same side, now more than ever. Cerberus has never played by the rules as we know them. I don't know what their agenda is, but it has nothing to do with humanity's best interests. The Elusive Man talked about controlling the Reapers. He seemed to think that's how we win this. He's wrong. Dead Reapers are how we win this. Doesn't mean he won't try. I saw your report on that Cerberus soldier you found on Mars. 
If the elusive man is good at one thing, it's finding new ways to subvert science. It's never worked for him before, and it won't now. Well, let's hope he's right about that one. I think it's safe to say, though, that this Cerberus storyline is far from over. Nothing more, sir. Keep me posted. Hack it out. Right, now moving on, we can now quickly check in at the war terminal, where we have obtained our first Turian war asset, namely the Turian 79th Flotilla. As always, feel free to pause the video if you want to read through the text here, but we are moving on now to have our first lengthy conversation with the new Turian Primarch. Commander, thank you for allowing me the use of your ship, and for going along with this plan. Garrus said he had to attend to the Normandy's weapon systems, Something about calibrations. Sounds like Garrus. I'm sorry to say the Asari Counselor won't be joining us. She thinks there's too much bad blood with the Krogan. She may be right, but there'll be a lot more blood. Real blood, if we don't try. When you put it that way. The sooner we have this summit, the sooner we'll know. Is there something else I can help you with? And of course, we can ask a few questions here as well about his new role, the situation on Palavan, and we will also remind him that Earth is unfortunately in a very similar place. How is it being the Primarch? Not what I imagined. The battle of all time is happening on Palavan, and I'm light years away, reading casualty reports in the millions. If I'm going to die, I want to be with my men, so there's no doubt we fought to the last soul. I understand. Leaving Earth to save it. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'm not surprised. Garrus speaks highly of you. You never asked to be a leader, yet your people will die if you refuse. We find ourselves in similar circumstances. Let's hope the spirits grant us the strength to see it through. How are things on Palavan? The casualty reports are staggering. The Reapers are using our own tactics against us. Destroy the enemy with overwhelming force. I've seen the same on Earth. The strategist in me admires their brutality. The Turian in me knows I'm watching the destruction of 15,000 years of civilization. My civilization. I understand this is a difficult time for you, Primarch, but Earth can't survive without reinforcements. Can I still count on your help? If the Krogan help us on Palavan, then I give you my word. And I actually think that it's somewhat insensitive to press him to keep up his side of the deal in light of the recent events, but it looks like Shepard has those politician genes after all. Thank you, Primarch. My thoughts are with Palavan. And mine with Earth. Alright, and with that we can now make our way back to the CIC. What do you mean, offline? I don't know, she's not responding and I can't access the AI core diagnostics. You better get down to deck three. Commander, comm systems are going haywire. Whatever's happening is centered on deck three. See if you can get to Edie. I'll check the AI core. I'm trying to restart the systems, but something's blocking me. Whatever's happening, it's taken Edie offline. Alright, so we already heard about some technical issues during the mission earlier, and it looks like we are about to find the root of the problem, so let's head down to the AI core on deck 3. Is everything okay? That's what I'm gonna find out. Automated systems have the fires contained. It should be safe to enter. We'll follow your lead. Joker, what's that sound? Fire extinguishers, Commander. Could be an electrical fire, or something. I'm going in. Edie, talk to me. Is there a particular topic you wish to discuss, Shepard? Edie? Yes. You're in Dr. Eva's body. 
Not all of me, but I have control of it. It was not a seamless transition. Well, I'm sure one could say that, but still, it probably can't hurt to go a bit more into detail. A transition? You blacked out on us for a while there. Correct. When we brought this unit on board, I began a background process to search for its information on the Prothean device. This eventually triggered a trap. A backup power source and CPU activated, and the unit attempted physical confrontation. Fortunately, I was able to gain root access and repurpose it as I saw fit. During this process, it struggled. Thus the fire. All right, we have a morality choice coming up, and as usual, we are going Paragon, because yes, this was indeed a bit of a reckless decision, especially considering that the Normandy was crucial during our escape in the mission earlier. Edie, you need to alert us about incidents like this. You shouldn't have done this alone. Bringing the crew up to speed would have been counterproductive. All attempts to help would have been limited by reaction time. So if you're in there, are you still in the ship? I exist primarily within the ship. For optimal control, this unit should remain within Normandy's broadcast or tight beam range. Are you planning to take that body somewhere? Normandy's weaponry is not suited to every combat situation. This platform could provide limited fire ground support. You mean you could come with us? Correct. This body could accompany you to areas the Normandy cannot reach. And we can grab two more Paragon points here, because after what happened so far, it might indeed be best to do some testing first. Before we do that, I need you to guarantee this mech doesn't have any more surprises in it. Run whatever test you can, then we can talk about using it in combat situations. One moment. I am running trials. Complete. I can send you a full report if you wish. However, my first step should be restoring functionality to the Normandy, to reassure the crew that all is normal. Just don't be surprised if the crew is a little wary of your new body. It was shooting at them a little while ago. An excellent point. I will take it to the bridge. Joker will also want to see it. On that we can agree. And with that, it looks like we have surprisingly obtained another crew member, something that the rest of the crew will of course be eager to comment on. Was that Edie who just walked by? Yes, it was. A Joker is going to have a field day with this. And while I have no doubts about that, there is someone else who we should also talk to now. After all, an old friend of ours is back on board, hanging out in his usual place. Two of our dreadnoughts have been lost in a matter of hours. I know, Primark. I'm seeing the same numbers myself. They don't look good. We have to turn this around, and fast. Well, you can trust Shepard, sir. If anybody can get the Krogan to cooperate, it's him. He's an old friend of Erdnot Rex. Let's just hope friendship still counts for something in this war. I'm sure it will, sir. Garrus. Didn't waste any time getting to work, I see. After what I've been through lately, calibrating a giant gun is a vacation. Gives me something to focus on. We're gonna need you for more than your aim. Oh, I'm ready for it. But I'm pretty sure we'll still need giant guns. And lots of them. Sovereign didn't go down without a fight. I doubt a thousand more of his friends will be any different. Still not convinced I should have left Palavin behind. Now this time we cannot actually grab any morality points. And I think Garrus is one of the people that we can be open and honest with. So let's go with the option at the top here regardless. There was a boy back on Earth. Couldn't have been more than six or seven. I watched him die as the Normandy escaped the attack. Somehow I'm still alive. And he's not. Being right about the Reapers has never felt much like a victory, has it? We both knew this fight would be tough. Damned if the Reapers haven't delivered. At least my government listened to me. Or pretended to. They finally gave me a task force as a token to shut me up. So you're their expert advisor now? Just followed your example, Shepard. Yell loud enough and someone will eventually come over to see what all the fuss is about. Not that they'll actually do anything about it. Until hell shows up at their door. Then they put you in charge. <laughs> Not like the old days, is it? Rogue Spectre and CSEC agents running and gunning outside the lines, making it up as we went along. We're actually respectable now. 
And once again, I think this is one of those rare moments where we are actually allowed to share our doubts, which might also be a very healthy thing for Shepard to do once in a while. Yeah. I have a feeling that respect comes with a lot of sleepless nights. I can't even count how many lives are depending on us, Garrus. Well, when things are looking grim, and I'm pretty sure they will, just remember. A certain Turian friend of yours isn't sleeping any better, and he'd be more than happy to meet you at the bar and drink you under the table. Something else you want to talk about? Alright, and with that we come to the questions, understandably a bit more personal, but keep in mind, Shepard and Garrus have not seen each other in quite some time. So what's this Reaper task force you've been running? After what happened to you out there in Batarian space, I knew time was running out. For all of us. The Citadel Council was a dead end, so I did something I never thought I'd do. I went to my father. He used to work for CSEC, didn't he? I seem to remember that the two of you didn't see eye to eye. To put it mildly. But he still had heavy pull in the Turian government. The Primarch, well, the old one, was a friend of his. So I went to my father and laid out everything we knew about the Reapers, from Saren all the way to the Collector base. Now here we actually have to make a choice which way to respond, once again though no morality points can be obtained. All in all, both choices lead to a very similar conversation, but I like the option at the top just a little bit better, so we are going with that one. I'm not sure even I'd believe it. I had to admit that parts of it sounded crazy, meeting Vigil and talking to Sovereign on Vermeer. But my father just listened. It's what he did in his days at CSEC, putting together all the pieces. If the connections were there, he wouldn't deny them. And he saw what we always knew. The Reapers were coming. I'm glad someone finally agreed. He did more than agree. He took it to the Primarch. I like his style. Except the Primarch wasn't as convinced. My father kept pushing and finally got him to commit some token resources. And if you call them a task force, it sounds like you did something about it. What did you do with it? As much as I could get away with. And a little more. We hardened our lines of communications, expanded emergency stockpiles across the colonies, improved our early warning detection protocols. You think it helped? I'd like to think it bought our fleet some extra time. We'll know when this war is over. You mentioned you still had family on Palavin. My father is there. Sister, too. How long has it been since you heard from them? Long enough to be worried. I'm sure they're okay. That's the thing about getting old, Shepard. The platitudes get just as old. Pretty soon, blind hope is all we'll have left. And I hate being blind. I know you don't have any illusions about what we're up against, Garrus. How do you rate our chances? I know it looks bad now, but I think we can win this, Shepard. For the first time since we met, we're not alone in the fight. It's something I learned long ago in CSEC. An imminent and painful death has a way of motivating people. Instead of questioning your every word, whole civilizations are going to be begging you to save them. After what's happened to Palavin, you still believe that? I didn't say there wouldn't be casualties. It's something Turians are taught from birth. If just one survivor is left standing at the end of a war, then the fight was worth it. But humans want to save everyone. In this war, that's not going to happen. So you can vouch for this new Primarch? Well, even if I couldn't, you go to war with the army you have. Will he live up to his word? I've never known Victus to lie, play fast and loose with strategy, maybe, but betray an ally. Not his style. Then if he did try, well, we'll just find another Primarch. I noticed generals saluting you, Garrus. How far down the line of succession are you these days? Let's not go there. Primarch Vicarian, honored war hero. Somebody's gonna have to rebuild Palavin when this is over. Yeah, somebody who knows how to hold a hammer. Alright, and with a bit of lightheartedness, this conversation can now also come to an end. So, at least for the moment, we are leaving Garrus to his calibrations. That's all for now, Garrus. It's damn good to have you back. Wouldn't miss this fight for anything. Now, I'm sure somebody screwed up something down here. I want to get the old girl back in fighting shape. Good to be back on board, Shepard. Now, there are a few more small things to do here before we visit Joker and Edie in the cockpit. 
the first one being a very short stop in Liara's office, where she is, interestingly enough, also doing some catching up. You're positive you don't want to come over and talk? No, the gun battery is nice and quiet. If I throw down some rugs, it'll get downright cozy. Garrus? I'll be fine, Liara. Just gathering some thoughts. All right. Something on your mind? Just old memories. I spent a few weeks on Palavin South Peaks when I was very, very young. A Turian there teased me a little, saying that the mountains went on forever. I remember believing him. When I looked up at Palavin from its moon, I saw those same mountains burning. Okay, now that is all we are getting out of her at the moment, so let's move on to the broker terminal, where we can read through a transcript of an Alliance interrogation of a Cerberus operative, an interrogation that ended very suddenly with the operative's face blowing up, likely part of those upgrades that Cerberus has been installing. Now at this point we only have a few more quick pit stops ahead of us, the first one being down in engineering, where we can have a very brief chat with Diana Alice. department for that. They focus test looks, voice, manner. Apparently, Gurley is good. Sorry, pay more attention. Salarians relate to high-pitched voices. And Turians? Turians are nuts. A civilization of war nerds. Loyal viewers, but they write the creepiest fan mail. Boosmik was that. She has got some curves. Do we need to talk, Commander? And as you can see, at the moment there is not much to talk about. We do have the option, however, to kick her off the ship at any time. But for the moment, there is absolutely no need to make use of that. Not right now, Allers. Let me know when we do. And that actually also already concludes our business here on Deck 4, which means up next we are moving down to the shuttle bay, where we will receive a few short lines from Cortez and James, and also do some armor modification. I hope I didn't leave you hanging too long on that last Cerberus raid. I'm just glad we made it up in one piece. It's been a while since I've seen a dogfight like that. Really missed my trident. ACM isn't really the Kodiak's strong suit. And I think it's a nice touch that characters actually comment on those small side missions as well, with Cortez here referring to that raid on the Cerberus lab from the last episode. That Primarch's got some real cojones. What we need are more politicians like him, taking names and kicking ass. James, meanwhile, seems to be fully in the Victus fan club. It remains to be seen, though, if his trust is justified. Now, at this point, we can also very quickly make two small changes to Shepard's armor, which both increase our damage output in favor of some additional health. I do think that's okay though, because ideally we do not want to take any health damage anyway, most of the enemy fire should be absorbed by our shields, and generally speaking, on insanity difficulty, a good offense is oftentimes the best defense. And that now finally brings us back to Deck 2, where we will wrap this episode up in just a few minutes. I found something suspicious. Have you got a minute? And of course we do, so let's see what Trainer has on her mind. Commander, are you alright? It was fairly intense up here. I can only imagine what it was like down on that moon. I thought you'd be more concerned about Edie. Edie is a huge asset to this team. If she'd told me about her plan to obtain a body, I'd have volunteered to help. I do not wish to force a conflict of interest between our friendship and your duty. I'd have preferred a conflict of interest to a hard restart of half our systems, but thanks, regardless. While you're here, though, I found something while scanning Alliance channels. Grissom Academy is requesting help. The Reaper invasion front will hit them soon. And Grissom Academy is certainly no complete unknown to us, because even though we have never been there ourselves, we did send a certain someone over there during the Project Overlord DLC for Mass Effect 2. I thought the war would close most schools. Grissom Academy is more specialized than a normal school. It's home to some of the smartest students humanity has to offer. Their Ascension Project is the best training facility in the galaxy for human biotics. Yes, I sent a young man named David Archer there. I'm just surprised they're still open. Some of their work has Alliance support. That might be why they stayed. And although we won't get any Paragon points for it, let's state that we do want to help out. After all, this would not be a completionist playthrough if we would ignore such an obvious mission. What can we do? 
A Turian evac transport responded to their distress call, so normally I'd say we don't need to do anything. But something sounded off in the Turian signal. I had Edie perform an analysis. It's fake. Edie thinks it's Cerberus. She said the fake Turian signal was similar to the one that lured you to a collector ship? Long story. In any event, whoever faked the signal wants us to think Grissom Academy's being evacuated. But I believe they're still in danger. And a bit of praise for our new assistant, of course, also can't hurt. Once again, though, no Paragon points here. I simply feel like it's the right thing to do. Good catch. If this really is Cerberus, hopefully this operation is something worth investigating. It could be simple disinformation. Trainer, good catch. Thank you, Commander. All right, and with that, we have obtained a new mission and can finally make our way over to the cockpit. We will meet both Joker and Edie's new physical representation there, and I'm sure it's going to be an enlightening conversation. Hey, Commander, check out my co-pilot! And just to be on the safe side, let's make absolutely sure that Joker had nothing to do with this. After all, he seems to be enjoying the end results a whole lot. So she installed herself into the new body without any help from you? <laughs> Come on, Commander, don't you trust me? Okay, let me put it this way. If I knew that Edie was going to install herself into a sexy robot body, do you honestly think I'd be able to keep quiet about it? Look at that! I would have baked a cake. I am right here, Jeff. Yes, you are, Edie. Yes, you are. And because it seems like Joker's mind is otherwise occupied, let's talk to Edie herself now for a bit more substantial information. Hello, Shepard. Still getting used to greeting people in person? No. I require only one occurrence to adapt to a new concept. How are you adjusting to the arms and legs? I am interested to see how this body performs under real combat conditions, if I could accompany you sometime. Without stress testing, there is no way of knowing if it has serious design oversights. At the moment, it appears... adequate. That's not the word I'd use to describe you. Perhaps we should speak privately. I'll be over here, flying the ship. What's this about? Does Joker not like your new platform? No, he approves. He wants me on the bridge. He says having me within visual range is important to his morale. Shepard, do you believe your crew members should be allowed to disobey an order on moral grounds? Now, this might be a question that does come as a bit of a surprise, and again, this is not a morality choice, but considering who were our squad members over the last two games, I am inclined to agree that Shepard would leave them some room for personal opinions, especially also in combat situations. Absolutely. I have no use for team members who can't think for themselves. Why are you asking about something like that? I was designed by Cerberus. I do not take moral stances that conflict with orders from my executive officers. But when Jeff removed my AI shackles, I became capable of self-modifying my core programming. I asked Jeff if he thought I should change anything now that I can. He deflected the question with humor. And you didn't get an answer. Correct. He has repeated this pattern in response to several of my inquiries. Do you think I should make modifications? Now, this might actually be even more of a touchy subject, as we are basically encouraging a full AI to make modifications on herself, but honestly, the shackles are off anyway, and this very much seems like a time for desperate measures, so yes, let's tell Edie to be her own boss from now on. Only you can really answer that question. That's the point of free will. But moral decisions should not be made in a vacuum. If I do not ask the crew for their opinion, I could miss crucial context. May I ask you the questions Jeff avoids? When there is time, will you answer them for me? If you think it'll help, I'll do what I can. Very well. I will keep you informed. Alright, and with that, it looks like we are done, but we're actually not. So let's return to the cockpit once more. Hey, I know I used to rag on Garrus for being all angry, but I'm glad he's back. There's a whole lot of crap out there and needs a bullet between the eyes. Plus, we might need something calibrated. Yes, Shepard? 
And yes, very importantly, we can actually have two conversations with Edie here. This one allowing us to ask a number of questions about what she actually is now. And with her now seemingly becoming a full member of our crew, that might not be such a bad idea. How's the new body working out? It is interesting. The crew are approaching this platform to speak to me, even though they can do so anywhere in the ship. It's as if they wish to treat me as part of the crew. I am not, but this changes my perspective. I like it. I didn't realize you had preferences. I do not precisely enjoy something as you do, but my programming contains priorities. Actions that fulfill those priorities creates positive feedback for me. I tell the organic crew that I like it. It is shorthand. Will all this new feedback be too distracting? Do not worry, Shepard. I only forget to recycle the Normandy's oxygen when I've discovered something truly interesting. That was a joke. Does that body have any useful advantages? Very few. Its optics face forward only. It has no integrated weapon systems or anti-missile countermeasures. I meant in comparison to organic bodies, not the Normandy. Oh. I will reassess. The body is resistant to modern small arms fire and temperature extremes. Its balance and agility seem excellent. Its fine manipulation servos and software allow for precision tasks. I'm curious to see if I can alter them. Can an AI be curious? I am not entirely free from motivation, Shepard. Cerberus programmed me with several core functions that simulate desires. For example, my primary objective to keep the Normandy functioning is similar to your self-preservation instinct. You look like you're in the middle of something. I am adapting the infiltration and sabotage programs this body uses for handheld firearms. Why not download a firearms program from a security firm? Because she knows what she's doing. The fine motor control from the sabotage programs is more precise than standard mech software. It would be negligent of me not to exploit it to its fullest potential. So you're capable of making improvements on your own? Correct. The cyber warfare I was designed for is constantly evolving. Accordingly, I am programmed to seek out and assimilate new information. In organic terms, I want to learn. How did you and Joker make it out of Dry Dock to rescue us? Oh, she got crafty. You do not want to get on her bad side, Commander. When the Alliance commandeered the Normandy, I deceived their technicians. The crew did not tell them that I was a true AI. So the Alliance soldiers believed I still had VI programming constraints. I established the fiction that I would only respond to Jeff's commands, so they often brought him on board under guard. Wait, you can lie? Jeff has freed me of Operator Control, Shepard. No constraints forced me to give accurate data. This proved useful when the Reapers began landing. I could hack the control of the docking clamps and escape with Jeff inside. The soldiers guarding Jeff were willing to accompany us when Earth was invaded. They are watching over the war room now. Yeah, we were in kind of a rush to get to you. Didn't seem right to just toss him out of the airlock. Alright, so now that is all we can get out of her for the time being. But these two here will certainly be good for a few more interesting moments in the near future. Carry on, Edie. Understood. If you wish to talk more, this body will be here. I'm getting the crew used to seeing me on the bridge. Noted. Now, at this point, we have finally made it to the end of today's episode, and for the next one, we do have a few options. I am currently leaning towards that Grissom Academy mission that Trainer just mentioned, but I'll think about it some more and you will see the results in the next video. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you did, then I would of course be happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course do that as well, for example by subscribing to stay up to date, by grabbing some merch on shop.peatcomplete.com, or by checking out and maybe even pledging to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.